Okay. I often lecture from a chair. Sometimes I sit on a table. Um, it's quite unorthodox. Um, but this is very Jewish, um, at least as far as I am concerned. Um, in, in Jewish settings, the teacher sits and the students stand. Certainly in the UK we follow the Greek model where the students sit and the teacher stands. But when Jesus um, sat when he gave the Sermon on the Mount, you will notice that Matthew specifically says Jesus sat. Because the notion of sitting in a Jewish setting is to indicate this is the moment when an authoritative statement is going to be offered. You'll get the same when the Pope is speaking it's spoken of him ex cathedra so when he sits he's going to say something significant and it relates back to the ancient jewish way of uh, speaking it also matthew says he sat and he opened his mouth and began to teach and you might think well he obviously had to open his mouth matthew so you don't need to tell me that but matthew is functioning himself as a teacher and he's reminding us that what jesus is about to do is he's sitting this is the status of authority. He opens his mouth. Ah, I understand something significant is going to happen. Sure enough, it does. He teaches. That's why Matthew, by the way, is put first in the Gospels. Because he's not the first Gospel to be written. Mark is the first Gospel to be written, as you know. But Matthew was recognized as being the teacher of the Gospels. It's not to say that the others don't teach, but they recognize that this was a Gospel specifically for the education of the early Christians. Matthew, for example, is the only Gospel to mention the word church. It's dedicated to teaching the earliest leaders, so it's put first, as well as, of course, Matthew is one of the 12 disciples, and that's why he's put first. Then Mark, then Luke, then John, who also is a disciple, but John wrote his gospel about 30 years after Matthew wrote his. Anyway, that's nothing to do with what we're doing today. We, we're going to be looking at the spirit. Are you coming to adjust me? Um, just to check out the table. Oh, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Man of many skills. You won't see this, but I happen to see it because I was sitting over there. That when he leads worship, he's always smiling. It's very nice. I'm watching you all the time. I'm in the middle of a little report about you, which I'll, I'll share with the congregation later. It's very nice to see him worshiping because he's thoroughly involved. It is you who's playing the guitar, isn't it? It's not somebody else. It's you. Right. Well, now, we've got some time. Um, and I'm wanting to explore what Paul has to say about the Spirit in the book of Ephesians. We'll do it until we run out of time. Um, and I know what time we're to finish. Do you know what? I've completely forgotten what time you said. Was it quarter past? Uh, uh, quarter quarter past. Uh, quarter till four, but you, we can adjust the time. You have, you have scheduled right now, you have a full hour. Right, an hour is what I'll work with. Okay. So I make it three o'clock, quarter to three, quarter to three. Right, good. Now, um, I would like it if you wish to participate. So if you want to ask a question or you want clarification or you're a little troubled about what I've said or I didn't quite catch that, can you please say it again, but in English this time, then please just <laughs> let me know. You might be a little nervous, but if you have a question that's burning and you're afraid to ask it because you think this is a silly question, it's quite likely that it isn't. In fact, it's quite likely that a lot of other people want to ask the same question, but they don't have your confidence. So please ask it. I'm very happy to say I don't know if I don't know, and I'll ask Pastor Jennifer to give the answer. But if I do know, <laughs> then I'm happy to explore with you. For me, this is an opportunity for us to learn together. I mentioned in the first service that whenever we're in a context like this, we must remove ourselves from thinking that the teacher is present sitting here because he's only a teacher with a small t. The proper teacher is sitting all around us and he's the Holy Spirit. And he will be speaking to us as I'm speaking to you. So I'm always interested to hear what the Spirit has to say because sometimes the Spirit will speak through you in a question that you might ask or in a comment that you might offer. 
Whenever I'm teaching, I will bring a pen with me because I'm interested in the possibility that the Spirit wants to teach me something, and then I will write it down in my notes. And I won't give you credit in the future, but I may well use what you have said in sharing with other people what the Spirit has said to us on this occasion when we're in Hong Kong together. So my, my basic question is, all right, we introduced this morning the notion that the Spirit is in us to do us good. He is not just by our side, he's on our side. I want to say that again because it's quite a provocative statement. He's on our side, which means he's for us. Now, obviously, he is not for us if we do something wrong or something that displeases him. But fundamentally, his commitment is to us. And there is no suggestion in the New Testament that that commitment is going to slacken or stop. It is a unilateral declaration on his part to stay close to us. How close? Closer than you can imagine, Keith. And his role is to take us from the moment we become Christians through this life until he presents us to the Father. He is a heavenly bodyguard who will never leave us, even when, by our lifestyle, we look as if we're leaving him, he will not leave us. And that's why Paul says, please don't hurt him. Don't sadden him. Don't disappoint him. Because when you do, you might think that he will leave. He won't do that. He will stay. And that's what makes sin such a tragedy for the Christian. Because we're not sinning against a rule. We're sinning against a friend. It's one thing for me to break the rules and go faster than I should coming to the airport from our home to London. It's another thing for me to hurt my wife, Judy. They're both wrongs, but one is, of course, much more significant than the other. And when we sin, we don't just break a rule, we hurt the spirit who has sealed us. So Paul says his commitment is thorough, but there are consequences. Now, I want you to metaphorically imagine that you, well, no, you can't metaphorically imagine, you can just imagine that you are sitting on a settee, a sofa, your favorite chair at home. You've got your feet up. Maybe you've got your slippers on if you wear slippers. I don't know whether you wear them in this country. It's too warm for slippers, I think. But in the UK, you wear them. And you've got a cup of coffee here, and you are leaning back, and you're relaxing. And that's how I want you to feel as we explore this together. Paul will spend chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3 of the book of Ephesians waterfalling us with good things about the Spirit's commitment to us. And when he finishes chapter 3, he says, Amen. Which makes you think, oh, he's finished the letter. But he's only finished part 1. Because then he'll start chapter 4, chapter 5, and chapter 6. And chapter 4 starts with, therefore. So the first three chapters, he has us sitting back in our chairs, we're relaxed, we're thoroughly enjoying being deluged with a catalog of good things that the Spirit is doing for us. And then in chapter 4, he starts off with, now, therefore, because of all of that, there are some things you need to bear in mind. Because the Spirit is thoroughgoingly on your side, chapter 4, you need to be united. Learn to like living with each other. Start living with each other in unity. Number two, don't make him sad. Number three, allow the spirit to control you. Number four, use the spirit when you pray. Uh, when you pray. Number five, use the spirit when you are wanting to communicate with others. So there are consequences. I don't think we're going to have time to get to chapter four. So you're going to stay in your metaphorical settee for a little while. But don't forget, please interrupt me when you've had enough or you want a break or you think... I need to know that you've had enough. I'm going to take you into chapter 1. Now, first of all, let me just introduce you to Ephesians or Ephesus. This is a city where Paul has been for three years. Prior to coming to Ephesus, he was in Corinth. Uh, Corinth was a sin and sex-obsessed seaport to the south of Greece. It was a hodgepodge of civilizations and the worst of immoralities came to this city. Paul was there after going to Athens and he spends 18 months establishing the church. And then he leaves 
and he crosses the water into the west of modern day Turkey, into Ephesus, and he establishes a church there. And he's there for three years, longer than any other place. And then he leaves there and he sends the letter to this church. It's a church that Luke describes as having been formed in a context of remarkable miracles, but significant suffering. And the suffering will increase when he leaves and he sends his young mentee, Timothy, to look after the church, troubles increase. Paul's reflection to the people in this letter of Ephesians relates to his congratulations to God because of the salvation that he has granted to us. And he talks about the Spirit, he talks about Jesus, and he talks about the Father. Our focus will be on the Spirit. And in chapter 1, the first thing that attracts Paul's attention is the gift of salvation. And he's so impressed with the gift of salvation that he wants to start his letter with a prayer of gratitude to God. I almost feel as if I have to stand up to talk about this. And I feel as if I did, I would be reflecting something of the excitement in Paul's voice when he explored the remarkable nature of salvation. He's writing from prison. He may well be in chains, but inside his heart is free as he explores just how wonderful the gift of salvation is from God to us. He starts this accolade in verse 3 and he finishes it in verse 14. As I mentioned in one of the services this morning, in the original Greek, that's one sentence. There's no full stops. So to try and read it without taking a breath would be a struggle. But it reflects just the enthusiasm of Paul. It's, he's, he's using something which is very Jewish. Of course, Paul is a Jew, a very trained Jew. And uh, he's using something called a berakah. And that's a Jewish word which refers to a paean of praise. A psalm of praise. The psalmist uses these in, in the psalms quite a lot. And that's what Paul starts off in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the words tumble out of him until you get to chapter 4. Uh, to verse 14 rather of chapter 1. The significance for us is that at the start of the Berakah and at the end in verse 3 and verse 14 there's a reference to the Spirit. So that's where we'll start our description of the role of the Spirit as reflected in this letter by Paul. Now I'm just going to briefly touch on verse 3 because I'm not too sure whether your uh, translations, if you have them in front of you, are different to this translation. Let me help you. You'll notice that in this translation, what he says in verse 3 is, blessed be God. So we want to give God blessing. And then he reminds us that God is the father of Jesus. But then he comes back to God and he says, now here's, here's what God has done. He has blessed us in Christ. He's referring to us there, you'll know that. This term, in Christ, is a, is a special word that Paul uses to describe Christians. We're in Christ people. Of course, what does that mean? And again, Paul, if he was here, would say, Keith, stop trying to understand my metaphors. What does it mean that we are in Christ? Because elsewhere he says that Christ is in us. How can we both? Paul is trying to point out the proximity between us and Jesus. We're in him. We're not literally in him. He's not a big fat person and we're all squashed inside him. But he's trying to identify that Christ and us are not separate. We are so close to each other in reality that he can call us in Christ people. So we, God has blessed us in Christ people with every spiritual blessing. You've probably got that in your translations, every spiritual blessing which sounds as if what Paul is saying is that we have been granted by the Father all kinds of spiritual blessing, peace, joy, salvation, grace. But he's not talking about material blessings. But the fact is, God does sometimes bless us materially. Sometimes we need something financial, physical, and he gives it to us. So I'm wondering, Paul, why you haven't said that here. The fact is that I'm not too sure if this is a very good translation with every spiritual blessing. 
I'll offer you what I think is a better translation. And here's the difficulty that our translators have. The word that you have got in your text for spiritual is the Greek word pneuma. And pneuma, which can mean spirit, can mean breeze, can mean wind, whenever Paul uses it, he uses it to refer to the Holy Spirit. Not the spirit of a person, a good spirit, a bad spirit. He uses it to refer to the spirit of God himself. So really, that ought to be a capital S, spirit. In other words, what Paul is saying is not that you Christians have been given all kinds of spiritual blessings. It's true. But Paul is trying to say something much more substantial than that. He's trying to tell us that God has blessed us Christians with every blessing from the Spirit. In other words, all that we have from God, physical, emotional, spiritual, financial, supernatural, natural, they come from the Spirit. Why is that significant to a first century audience? It's significant because, as I mentioned earlier today, the people are not aware that the gods give you good things. This is a shocking revelation to them. And let's remember the people that Paul is speaking to. They will have been Christians probably less than five years, at its longest. Before then, they were into all kinds of activities of a religious nature. Ephesus was the occult capital of the ancient world. Wizards, astrologers were dotted throughout the city of Ephesus. It was the third major city in the world at the time, the third most significant commercial place. That's normally a 10 pound fine. I don't know whose phone has just gone off, but I can't believe it. It's the worship leader. That is so <laughs> awful. Well, yeah, that's going in the report. I, I need to let him off because some time ago I was speaking at a conference and um, the place was packed and I did say beforehand, make sure your phones are off and a little bit of flurry activity as they did that. And then, would you believe it, 20 minutes into my talk, somebody's phone went off and it was there, just where Brigitte is sitting. It wasn't her. And uh, I said, oh, can you just switch your phone off? And nobody moved. And, I, and it kept ringing. So I said, no, no, can you, can you switch it off? And nobody moved. No, they said, it's not mine. And then I realized it was mine. <laughs> so, so, so you let off, it's okay. <laughs> I've completely lost my track and I have no idea where I am. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna have to start all the way from the start. <laughs> Ephesus occult capital of the day. They were aware of supernatural phenomena. If you wanted, for example, to have somebody fall in love with you, or if you wanted to have protection because you were going on a dangerous journey, you would go to Ephesus and you would buy something which was called an Ephesian letter. It was a special magical charm. I have copies of these in my study at home. And it would be a prayer to a god or a goddess, some deity, and within it was embedded a prayer that would result in you having what you wanted. In other words, the people were aware of supernatural phenomena, but these prayers rarely worked, but they still lived with the tenacious hope that sometime we might be the lucky ones. But for the majority of the people, they didn't even think that the gods cared enough about you at all. So when Paul says, can I come back to that? Yeah, when Paul says that as Christians, you have been blessed with blessings from the Spirit, he is saying something very powerful, very meaningful to them, but just as meaningful to us. But we probably need to remind ourselves of that a bit more, that the fundamental role of the Spirit is to do us good. Even when he's chastising us, it's to do us good. Even when he's refining us and it's painful, it's to do us good. He's transforming us into the likeness of Jesus. Now, there's one other thing that he adds, and he says, in heavenly places. Now, this is a term that is only used in the book of Ephesians, and it is very understandable to the people of the day, because it refers to where the gods live. He's not saying that these spiritual blessings are in the heavenly places, and sometime in the blue yonder we'll get them dropped down to us. He's not saying that we have got spiritual blessings waiting for us in heaven, and when we die and go to heaven, we'll get them. Quite the contrary. He's saying that the Holy Spirit is there to bless us, 
This is not intended, by the way, to make you feel encouraged on the basis of very little evidence. I'm not there just to make you feel good. This is the truth of what the text is saying. And right at the start of his letter, he's wanting to establish to the Christians Get it central in your mind, the Spirit is there to do you good. He's there to bless you. And I'm resisting it and saying, no, 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 I'm, no I, you don't know who you're talking to. You're talking to me. You don't know what I did yesterday. I don't deserve that. The Spirit will probably say, I did know what you did yesterday, funny enough. In fact, I knew what you were going to do before you did it. But I'm still going to be blessing you because this is more about me than it is about you. The point is, though, where is he? Who is he? What kind of a Spirit is he? Paul says, He's a spirit who's associated with heavenly places. In other words, the term the heavenly places is used to refer to the place where the gods live. So the spirit who is blessing you is not some underworld god. He is not some demigod. He is not a secondary god. He is not a subservient god. He's not one that's down there. He's up there. He is where the gods live. This is an authentic, it's a gift of integrity that is being given to you. Wow. Now that's just the start. And then he begins to talk about the best gift that the Spirit gives us, which is our salvation, which is in association with the Father and Jesus himself. We have been blessed with every blessing that the Spirit has available. Remarkable. And then he gets to verse 14. Well, in fact, he gets to verse 13. And let me take you to verse 13. Are, are we okay so far? Yes. Yes. Okay, do you want to say anything? <laughs> Amen's a good response, but anybody got any comment, question? You know, okay so far? Fine, okay. Somebody who's going to be courageous enough and to put your hand up, and that'll be fine also. I'll just ignore you. So, <laughs> verse 13. Paul is coming to the end of his better car. He's running out of breath, and he slows himself down as best he can, and he says this in verse 13. In him... In him, you also, who have heard the word of truth, which is the glad tidings of your salvation, you've believed in, is this the Amplified Version? Yes. I thought there were a lot more words than I realized. That's fine. Oh, this is another one. This is the SV, but that's fine, that's fine. So let's go with this one. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So we're back to the Spirit again at the end of this. Congratulations to God for salvation. By the way, this little statement, in him, is another shorthand description of who a Christian is. You are an in him person. Who's the in him? Well, that's Jesus again. You are in him. I don't feel as if I'm in him. I don't think I deserve to be in him. I don't deserve to be in him. Well, never mind. You are in him because Jesus has put you in himself, so to speak. Who is he speaking to? Special sanctified Christians, people who've been going there on the long way. No, he says, if you've heard the word of truth, which is the gospel, and you've believed, then I'm speaking to you. And that's all of you. However long you've been a Christian, you've heard the word of truth, you've believed in it. Therefore, you are an in him person. Paul says, what you need to know extra to that is that you have been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Wonderful. Excellent. I have no idea what it means, but thank you anyway that I've been sealed. Well, for 21st century Christians, we probably don't know what he means. And why should we? Because we're not first century people. But if you were a first century person, resident within that notion of a seal, are some very significant issues that would make you feel very special. So we need to think about it again through the eyes of a first century person. In the first century, people carried with them seals, and they carried with them seals in the same way that you carry a mobile phone. For some of you, it's never away from you. It's there. And in the first century, they didn't have mobile phones unless they were very well off. They had seals. And the seals were used for a whole pile of reasons. And when Paul says you've been sealed, immediately a number of pictures come to their mind that mean something to them. So I want to unpack that with you. But first of all, remind yourself when this sealing happens. It happens when you've believed. So it happens when you became a Christian. You might say, well, actually, I can't remember when I became a Christian because the process was a little bit of a journey. 
Well, it didn't matter. God knows when you became a follower of his, and that's the time when he will send the Spirit and seal you. You don't have to ask the Spirit to seal you. He does it himself because he wants to seal you. Yeah, but what is it? Well, let me help you. Let me take you back in the first century. And you are wanting to identify that something belongs to you. How are you going to do it? Well, you will take a seal, which is basically uh, a little piece of metal or a little stone or a piece of onyx, and inscribed on it will be your signature or the first letters of your name or your family crest or your motto, and you will impress it on some wax. And when it hardens, the inscription will be retained. That's the seal. So archaeologists have found all kinds of parchments, documents, objects, boxes, and impressed in them has been a seal. And the seal has said something like, belonging to A, the son of B, belonging to C, the daughter of the king. In other words, the seal signifies ownership. I have a seal on my finger. It's a ring. It means somebody owns me. It's Judy. She has one, her finger, which means somebody owns her, it's me. The seal indicates ownership. Now, hear what Paul is saying? Ephesians, you Christians who feel somewhat marginalized, uh, somewhat maligned because of your minority status in Ephesus, you are surrounded by rich people, you are surrounded by people who think you are weird, somebody has decided that he wants to own you and his name is God, and the Spirit is your seal. It's not that Spirit seals us with something else, the Spirit is our seal. He is God's way of saying, Christians, I want you to have something as a gift from me, and I could give you a statement that is written down in a heavenly book, I could give you a promise that you tuck inside your top pocket, but instead, one of the Godhead, the Spirit of God himself, is coming into your life, and his fundamental purpose there is to say, you are owned. You belong. You belong to me. Implication? Well, if I belong to God, then that means that nobody, but nobody, can intrude in my life without his say-so. That's exactly what it does mean. Because if they do, they're trespassing on territory that does not belong to them. We are owned by God. Thank you, Paul. But then the seal means something else. Imagine that you are a merchant and you are going to the harbor in Ephesus. Remember, this is the third most important commercial base in the world at the time after Rome and Alexandria. And you will go to the harbor. By the way, the harbor in Ephesus is no longer. The river has so badly silted up that it's now seven kilometers from the city of Ephesus. But in the day, it was there lapping up against the city. And you're wanting to buy some wood. You purchase the wood. You don't have any money. You simply put your seal on the wood. And that means the bargain has been struck. Nobody can purchase that wood. You have bought it. No money has changed hands, but there's been a secure transaction taking place. Do you hear what Paul is saying? Christians, you might wonder, oh dear me, what if I lose my salvation? What if I step out of line? What, I, what if I sin so badly that God is going to reject me? I'm surrounded by sin. There are so many opportunities for sin in Ephesus. If you think Hong Kong has got some bad places, you ought to go to Ephesus. It's a very sinful place. All kinds of opportunities for Christians to fall out of line with the Spirit of God's will on their lives. What if I am not yet a Christian? I'm not sure. Paul says salvation is God's job. It's not your job. You don't claim salvation. He gives salvation. And the spirit in your life is God's way of saying your role, or excuse me, the transaction has been completed. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean to say that we can say, well, thank you very much. I've always wanted to sin a bit more. Now I can do it with great pleasure because I'm completely saved. There were some people in the first century who thought that's what salvation was all about. The way of expressing your belief in God's grace was to sin a bit more. Oh, no, they got it completely wrong. 
Paul is saying, no, no, that's not a, a true understanding of grace. A true understanding of God's grace to you is that you respond with a remarkably more intense commitment to Jesus for his um, lavish love in your direction. The seal signifies salvation is being completed. Just comes to my mind, I don't know if you know, I, I rarely read the Old Testament since I'm a New Testament teacher, but some of it I've been told is true. And I'm just teasing, just teasing. I do believe that all of it is true. I just heard Judy laugh, which was a reminder that what I've said wasn't exactly true. But some of you weren't too sure whether it was that I believe what I've said. Of course, the Bible is God's word. But in Jeremiah, there's a description there of Jeremiah buying a field. God tells him to buy a field. And he tells him to buy a field because that field is going to be redeemed by Jeremiah in time. But at the moment, the whole nation is going into exile. And you might think, well, what's the point of buying a field then? Because I'm not going to be able to use it. But the point is that God is saying to Jeremiah, but the people are coming back. And at that time, you'll redeem the field. Now, in the process of him buying the field, Jeremiah does something very strange. He takes his shoe off and he gives it to the person who's selling the field. Didn't mean much in a, in a, in a British context, but it did in an ancient context because the giving of the shoe to somebody else meant the transaction has been done. The deal has been struck. The bargain has been completed. Spirit in your life, don't listen to the devil when he makes you think that you're a bit more vulnerable than you are truly. You've been sealed. Who's done it? Somebody unimportant? No, the Spirit of God. God himself, the authentic one, is the one who sealed you. Anything else about the seal before we move on? Well, perhaps there's something that I could mention. And uh, I think Judy lent me some money. She does give me some money from time to time just to make me feel a little secure. So if I reach in my back pocket, see what I pull out. Oh, dear me. It's one of these. Big one. 500. Very ornate and carefully put together piece of paper. You will know that. But you will also know, and I don't even have to lift it up to the light to see it, that there are at least one, there is at least one seal here. And it's the seal that makes this not just a pretty piece of paper, but something that has value. Now understand therefore the message of Paul to the Ephesian readers and the message of Paul to you, because when the Spirit comes into your life, it's the Spirit's way of saying, I value you. In fact, I value you more than you value yourself. And I value you certainly more than you think I value you. I know you've only been a Christian for a millisecond and I've come straight into your life, but don't lose sight of the fact that I'm doing it quite deliberately as a means of saying you are valued. In the ancient world, you did not bother to seal anything that wasn't valuable. You didn't seal anything that wasn't valuable to you. You only sealed something that was valuable to you, that you wanted to define as being owned by you, that you wanted to demonstrate to everybody else, listen, that's mine. Don't touch it. It's mine. It's my seal that's on it. God's message to you, God's message to me, God's message to the devil, God's message to those who don't know Jesus and who don't know our status as Christians is they belong to me, they are secure in that position, and they are valued. I value them, they're special people. Wow. Yeah, it's definitely an amen. And for the people in Ephesus, they, as they sit back on their metaphorical settees, hearing Paul saying it, these truths wash over their lives with significance. That is the position of our security. Now remember, we've got chapter 4, we've got a therefore, there are consequences, but let's not think about them yet. Let's enjoy what Paul is saying about what the Spirit's involvement in our lives is intended to demonstrate. To a worthless group of people, as the Ephesians would have thought themselves in the context of this pagan city, God's for us. Let me take you into verse 14. I'm just a bit troubled. We're not going to get to chapter 3 at this rate because you keep talking too much. But, um, <laughs> but we're going to move into verse 14, whether you like it or not. So, because this is the final thing that Paul will say at the end of this little peon of praise to God. He says, 
The Spirit, verse 13, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. Okay. So this is the final thing he says about the Spirit. He says the Spirit is the guarantee. Now, Paul does something that some of you uh, multilingual people do. He uses a word in one language and he simply puts it into the other language by changing the letters. And he uses a Hebrew word, which is arabon, and he uses the word arabon and he puts it into Greek. There is no Greek word arabon, but he just uses Greek script instead of Hebrew script. Why? Because in his speech, arabon in Jewish is very important. It means a guarantee which is what our English translation has. What are you trying to tell me, Paul? I'm trying to tell you that as well as the Spirit coming into your life to remind you that you are sealed, you are safe, you are owned, you are valuable, you are protected, the Spirit in your life is also there as a guarantee, a first installment, a down payment, something that rings itself around you. Okay, thank you for that. What's been guaranteed? Well, he tells us, the Spirit is guaranteeing our inheritance. In other words, what Paul seems to be saying is that the role of the Spirit when you become a Christian is to come into your life and to walk with you throughout your life so that when you get to heaven, you will be introduced to the Father and you will receive your inheritance from the Father. The Father will give you some gifts, not rewards, because we don't deserve anything. In fact, we don't deserve gifts. But nevertheless, the Father, because he's a good God, loves to give gifts. The Spirit's role is to keep us, this heavenly bodyguard who walks with us throughout our lives, gives us to the Father, and the Father says, thank you so much for looking after them. I'm going to give them a gift. Now, that's, that's, that's worth another amen. I'm not encouraging you to do it, because there's a better amen coming. <laughs> that would be fine. If Paul is simply saying, this is the commitment of the Spirit, it's just always going to be with you, so that when you get to heaven, you'll get your prize. Smashing, thank you. Don't need it, but that's unbelievable that you're doing it. But I don't think Paul is saying that. I think he's saying something much more remarkable. And I think he's saying this. And here's another problem that our translators have. This is a very difficult sentence to translate from the Greek. And if you know more than one language, you'll know that that sometimes is the case. But this word here, possession, which in your translations you might actually have the word redemption, in, the, in Paul's writings, whenever he talks about something being redeemed, it's always God who does the redeeming. In other words, it's God is the one who receives the inheritance. Now, hear what I'm saying? Here, in this translation, it is we, you and me, who get the inheritance, which is a biblical truth. When we get to heaven, God will give us good gifts. The Spirit is supportive of that truth coming into reality. But here, Paul is saying something much more significant than that. He's saying that when we get to heaven, it's not we who will get our inheritance, but God who will get his inheritance. What do you mean? What's God's inheritance? You. You, me, we are God's inheritance. And I say, no, absolutely not. Why would God want to inherit us? We're not particularly worthy. Even where we've been clean, sanctified, washed in the blood and all the rest of it, we're still not particularly worthy of being viewed as anybody's inheritance, let alone God's inheritance. That's exactly what Paul is saying. The role of the Spirit is to stay with us so that when we get to the end of our lives, the Spirit will say, Father, here's your inheritance. Here's what you've been waiting for. Of course, it's not that the Father hasn't been participating in our lives whilst we've been on this earth. Of course he has. But then we will be with him for eternity. The Spirit's role functioning in our lives is, yes, maybe to ensure that when we get to heaven, we'll receive gifts from God. But it is also, and I suggest much more significant, than when we get to heaven, we will be given to the Father and the Father will say, Great, so glad you're here. Now we can thoroughly enjoy eternity together. Me and my inheritance, you, individuals. And if you need extra support for that, I just need to take you a few verses later into verse 18, and Paul says exactly the same thing. Verse 18, this is what I want the Spirit to do in your lives, he says. I want your eyes to be enlightened so that you might know your hope, the hope to which God has called you, you who are the riches of his glorious inheritance. 
And I'm saying, what's glorious about me? What's glorious about you? How can you, Paul, describe us as being God's glorious inheritance? It's, it's difficult to believe that we could be God's inheritance, let alone God's glorious inheritance. What is associated with glory about us? That's the point. We are completely associated with glory. In other words, we have been redeemed from a position of being dead, blind, enemies of God, Paul says in Ephesians, alienated from his grace. We have been taken from that pers perspective, from that position, and we have been raised to share with Jesus in the heavenly places. What on earth was in the mind of the God who did that? Because it is stupid. Why would anybody want to do that? Why would any God want to invest so much love into a fragile, vulnerable, sinful group of people? Our God. Salvation, you see, reflects the kind of God we have. He is a God defined by grace, by love, by goodness, by purity, by doing something that other people will benefit from. It's not because he needs us. It's not because he can't function without us, but it's telling us that he wants his love not to just be experienced by him, Father, Son, Spirit, he wants it to outflow onto others. So this is what makes us a glorious inheritance. Not that we are glorious by definition, but because we reflect something about the glory of God. Because we're saved, we reflect the love of God. Because we're redeemed, we reflect the grace of God. Because we have been taken from where we were to where we now are and where we will be in the future. And that reflects something about the remarkable nature of the bountiful grace of God. We are God's glorious radiating inheritance. Gracious me. And are you telling me, Paul, that's why the Spirit is in me? Paul would say, yes. Now, with my Pentecostal hat on, I think, yeah, yeah, but... Um, there's got to be a so what. There's got to be something I've got to do. Surely I've got to bend, walk on bended knees over broken glass for a long period of time as a result of this remarkable grace that God has given to me. Well, Paul says, no, none of that at all. This is just God. Sit back in the chair. Stop standing on your feet. Put your feet up again and enjoy the grace of God that has been manifested through the Spirit's involvement in your life. Unbelievable. Yes, and it would be unbelievable if it wasn't for the fact there was God who's in charge of this process. We are God's inheritance. Remember the people of the day, they didn't anticipate personal relationships with God. If God, if any God thought about them once in a blue moon for half a second, that would be more than they deserved. They didn't expect anything more. And what our God does for us is so the opposite that it just is mind boggling, but it's true. And because we struggle to cope with it, God says, I've got to have to send somebody who's going to be a permanent companion to keep whispering these truths into your mind. But please listen to him. Because if you stop listening to him, if you're not aware that he's putting these truths into your mind, you're not going to be able to benefit from the truth of what he's saying. You are going to live in that tentative nature of uncertainty and fear. And the fact is you can't be any more secure than you are because God's in your life and the spirit is the demonstration of it. Wow, that's quite remarkable. So, have you got anything to say or ask? Because we're going to have to, it's just going to be me talking otherwise. You, you want to go? No. You've got a question or something. <laughs> I understand. Good, good. Let me just comment on that first because I wouldn't want you to misunderstand. I'm not saying that somehow the Spirit is more important to the process of salvation than Jesus. 
most of the time when we talk about our salvation, we do focus on Jesus, and rightly so, because he was the one who died on the cross and saved us. But I wouldn't want you to think that the Father and the Spirit didn't have a, a part control in that. It wasn't that Jesus was the one who came, because he was the only one who was prepared to come, and the Father and the Spirit stayed having cups of coffee for those 33 years. They were all involved in the process of salvation, and Jesus comes and saves us practically, but now the Spirit comes as the second part, to remind us of the truth of that and perhaps to illustrate just how remarkable that salvation was even than we might have thought carry on um, yeah and uh, uh, wow well, actually I, I, I'm a little bit confused about uh, the, the teaching about the, the, t the doctrine of the spirit because I thought our security is is in Jesus because he died for us on the cross and his work finished and it's that means our redemption is finished and uh, then the Spirit comes. I agree with that. We have the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit is very important. But I think the one who brings us healing, salvation, and all security is Jesus. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, you can sit down, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I don't disagree. I'm just wanting to recognize that Jesus and the Spirit and the Father are thoroughly engaged in this process of salvation. As far as the Gospels are concerned, you were right, the focus is on Jesus. And the Father and the Spirit take, it seems as if uh, they're somewhat in the shadows, it's Jesus who is the focus. And it's the salvation that Jesus procures that has resulted in us being children of God, Christians, followers of Jesus. With you all the way. We don't. There's no fundamental disagreement there. My focus here is to recognize what the Spirit does, not to take the place of Jesus, but what the Spirit does in our lives once our salvation has been achieved by Jesus. So the Spirit comes into our lives and reminds us of what Jesus has done, but then begins to open up so that we begin to appreciate just how remarkable that initial act of salvation was which is to engage in a relationship with God. Okay, right, good question. May I ask one? No, but thank you for being so polite. So now what we're going to do is, if it's a difficult question, I will be very cross. <laughs> it's about, the, it's a compliment that you can make for us because you, you talk about the seal and about the guarantee. And uh, can you comment on the doctrines of uh, breaking the curse? Because some people are quite confused uh, about that. It's like our salvation is not enough. You need to do this, you need to do that. So what you have said, it is done. It is completed with the seal, with the job, with the guarantee. Yes. Uh, well, by the way, you don't have to agree with everything I say. I, I hope that you will, but I'm not wanting to force my views on you, unless it happens to be in, in the Bible. Um, so what I'm about to say, you might not agree with. Um, I don't believe that we are under any curse as Christians, would be my perspective. Um, that's not to say that I don't believe that the devil has any power, but the trouble is too often we believe in the publicity that the devil will offer. And the devil has, is no threat to us because we are children of God. And whenever the devil sees us, he sees Jesus because Jesus is committed to us, the Father is committed to us, the Spirit is committed to us. So already he's fallen. The trick is, is that he will seek to deceive us into thinking that the battle has not been completely won by Jesus. But it has. Do you remember I mentioned this morning in the temptations in one of the services, the temptations of Jesus in, in the wilderness? Each of those temptations was prefaced by the devil saying to Jesus, if you are the son of God. Now, it sounds as if the devil is trying to sneak past Jesus' defenses. If you're the son of God, do this. I don't really believe you are, but if you are. But you need to be aware that the little Greek word for if is a, and a could also and as easily be translated as since. 
So put that in your thinking. Now, let's change that statement by the devil. He may be saying, not if you're the son of God, but since you're the son of God. In other words, the devil knew completely who Jesus was. He wasn't wondering, who's this person who's come here? He knew exactly who Jesus was and treats him as one who is worthy of some measure of honor. Since you're the son of God, do this. The point I'm trying to illustrate is that the devil is never deceived into thinking that he has more power than he has when he is in um, a conflict with Jesus. He knows that he is a defeated foe even before the battle has commenced. So when Jesus is with you, when the Father is with you, and the Spirit with you, the devil knows that he is the weaker member. But of course he knows that we sometimes forget that. And so he will seek to take advantage of our own vulnerability, our own inability to remember our security and our status, and he will deceive us into thinking that we are rather more vulnerable than we are, when the truth is quite the opposite. We cannot be more secure than we are as Christians now than in a billion years' time in heaven. We are still as in Christ then as we are now. What we need to do is keep reminding us of that truth. And there are times when life is so awful to us that we can feel, where is God? Why aren't you helping us? Even maybe we shouldn't have become Christians because we have joined the wrong club. This is not the good one to be in. We can feel that and we have to keep reminding us of, our, of the truth that we are completely secure. When Jesus died on the cross, I'm coming to the end of my very long answer to your rather more succinct and well-spoken question. When Jesus died on the cross, in the Greek, it's one word, tetelestai. Tetelestai, which is translated, it is finished. But it should be better translated as it has been finished. In other words, what Jesus is doing is using the perfect tense of the Greek word teleo. And in Greek, a perfect verb means something that has happened, but it has ongoing significance. When Jesus says it has been finished, he means it has been finished, it will be finished, it is completely finished then. What's finished then has ongoing significance. What's been finished? What's been finished is the domination of the devil over people who are going to be in my kingdom. So that's you, you're in his kingdom, it's been finished, job done, transaction completed, you've been sealed. Now think about this, Jesus dies, he comes into death, why does Jesus die? If it's been finished, why does he die? One of the reasons why Jesus dies is to demonstrate to you and to me that he has the authority of death. How do I know? Because he comes back. If he didn't die, we'd never be too sure. If he just died and went to heaven, we'd think, well, has it been finished? Because we can't really be sure. But he dies, comes out of death three days later, and says, there you go. It has been finished, doesn't it? Well, blow me down. Yes, I think it has, because you've come back. Now, when he dies, maybe the devil and the demons think, good, we've got him, he's on our territory. But when they see him, they do not see a defeated foe. They don't see somebody who's been scarred and maligned and scourged and killed. He is not a defeated foe. He is not a weakened, defenseless enemy. He comes, he strides into death to continue the rest of his journey, and then he pops back into this life just to say, do you see it? I've won. I've won. Got it? You guys, I've won. Now I'm going up to heaven to carry on and the Spirit is coming to take over. But everything that needs to be done has been completed. So I'm always a bit nervous when I see people referring back to the Old Testament to talk about curses when it's the New Testament that's largely been written to declare the fact that our salvation is secure. And in fact, you as Christians have been given the opportunity to have a relationship with God that believe it or not, it's true, is superior to the relationship that Isaiah had with God, that David had with God, that Moses had with God. These great heroes and Jewish heroines, we have the opportunity to have a closer relationship with God than they. Why? The Spirit has come to live within us permanently in a way that he never did with anybody in the Old Testament. But he does now. Because Jesus has given him to us in the way that the Spirit never functioned in the lives of ordinary people in the Old Testament. So, so you're completely secure. Sorry, long answer. <laughs> it's always a bit troubling if it isn't the answer to the question. 
but I think it did touch on what uh, Pastor yeah. René asked. Right, so I'm going to move on again now. So I'm looking at you, but I'm actually not looking to see if there are any hands raised because... <laughs> did you see quarter two? Pastor Jenny, is it quarter? I keep forgetting. Gracious me, we're never going to get to chapter... Th we're never going to get to chapter two. Um, I tell you what, we will go to chapter two. Um, but then part of me is not wanting to comprehensively explore all that the Spirit uh, does for us, even in the letter to, to Ephesians. But if I've whetted your appetite to look for more, then, then fine. And, and I've written some stuff on this that you can get from my website if you wish. Didn't mean to put that plug in, but it's too late now. I've said it. <laughs> Chapter 2, verse 18. Let's have another little picture here that he offers to us. Um, Now, this is what this verse says. <clears throat> You're still on your metaphorical settees enjoying what Paul has to say about the Spirit. For through him, this is Jesus, again, keeping the focus on Jesus, Paul is never so Spirit-centered that he is not also Jesus-centered. Sometimes people think that Pentecostals are so Spirit-oriented that we have forgotten Jesus. The fact is that most Pentecostal denominations are rather more centered on Jesus. Jesus is our Savior, Healer, Baptizer, Coming King, and so forth. But we're trying to recognize that the Spirit also has a part to play, and so does the Father. Paul says, through him, through Jesus, we both, that is Jews and Gentiles, have access in one spirit to the Father. Now, as with nearly everything that Paul says about the Spirit, it's associated with some symbol, some metaphor. And the reason he does that is because it's easier for us as people to think in pictures rather than to simply have a list of doctrinal tenets that are relayed to us. And the picture that Paul uses on this occasion is embedded in this word, access. We don't realize that because we don't necessarily understand Greek. But Paul has used a Greek word here that's translated as access that makes a whole pile of sense to the first century readers, not just in Ephesus, but to other places that will read this letter from Paul. Now, the context of what he is saying is that God, for much of his relationship with people chose to relate to the Jewish people. Why did he choose the Jews? It's up to God. He chose the Jews over the Egyptians or the Babylonians. It was the Jewish people that God chose to relate to. Not because they were particularly worthy of God. It was just the Jewish people. I'm going to work with them. So they are the ones who have the prophets. They have the Old Testament. They have God relating to them. Come New Testament, God's agenda is... Actually, I'd like a few Gentiles to be part of the church now, if you don't mind. I'll have a few Samaritans. Shocking to the Jewish people. Couldn't cope with it. Do you remember that when the Samaritans hear the gospel, Peter and John are sent by the apostles in Jerusalem to go check it out? Because, of course, why would God choose the Samaritans? The Jewish people and the Samaritans did not get on at all in the life of Jesus. And God's agenda is... Samaritans, I want you in my family as well. Peter and John go down, check it out, and blow me down. The Spirit baptizes those people, and they begin to speak in tongues. And you can imagine Peter and John saying, well, hang on, hang on, how come they're doing that? Because that's what happened to us. The fact that it's happening to them indicates that although this is shocking, the Spirit's agenda is that the Samaritans should be as much a part of God's family as the Jews. Shocking. Very little in the Old Testament to indicate that the Samaritans would be part of God's family. But we'll accommodate it because the Spirit has clearly sealed them. But that's no more. No Welsh people. <laughs> and then Peter is told by God to go and talk to Cornelius, who you will know is a Gentile. Peter don't want to go. I'm not going there. He's a Gentile. We know what you're going to do to the Gentiles, and they jolly well deserve it. They're going to be killed for their sins, and rightly so. Go talk to Cornelius. And eventually, as a result of a vision, Peter goes, and he preaches the gospel to Cornelius, and the Spirit interrupts Peter's sermon, what a cheek, and baptizes Cornelius with the Spirit. In other words, Gentiles are already are also to be drawn into the church. This is shocking for the people in the first century that you have a Roman peasant, a, 
a, a Gentile centurion, Samaritans and Jews being part of God's racially mixed congregation, family. We are used to it. We've reflected in our congregation here this afternoon. Shocking in the first century. Now, Paul says, verse 18, who has brought this about? It's the Spirit. But again, be careful. I am not saying that it's the Spirit who does this and Jesus has nothing to do with it and the Father has nothing to do with it because whatever the Spirit does, Jesus and the Father do as well. They cannot function independently. Well, I guess they could, but why would they when they're all together sharing the same common will? But as what Paul is saying is, I want you to be reminded of the Spirit's involvement with this because the Spirit is the one who's been given to you. Not to the exclusion of Jesus, not to the exclusion of the Father, but the Spirit is the face of the Godhead to us. He has brought us together. Okay, got that. Now, where I'm coming to this word access, something else Paul says to us. Because this word access in the Greek is prosagogos. Who cares? Prosagogos. Well, the prosagogos, the word, comes from a prosagogue. Now, if you are, notice a couple of African faces here. If you've come from an African context, you will already be aware of the significance of a prosagogue, although you will give a different word to it, certainly in some countries in Africa. But let me tell you what it was in the first century. The prosagogue was somebody who was there to introduce you, ordinary person, to somebody who was extraordinary person. Somebody who was a king, somebody who was a bit special, they would take you and they would introduce them to you. That's what the Spirit does for you. He takes you and he introduces you to God. Now, don't misunderstand the agenda, the, the metaphor, because that sounds as if, oh, so I can't go straight to God the Father then, can I? The Spirit has to introduce me. That's not quite what Paul is trying to say. He is not saying that there is somebody in between us and the Father. Because, of course, you know that you can talk straight to the Father. Like Jesus says, our Father. We don't have to talk through somebody else. We don't need a mediator. Well, Paul, it sounds as if you're making the Spirit a mediator. Well, elsewhere in the New Testament, it is Jesus who is the mediator. So who is it? Do we have to go through Jesus? And then the Jesus has a word of the Spirit, and the Spirit eventually says, okay, the Father's ready to talk to you. Get the message back to the Spirit. Spirit back to Jesus. <laughs> back to me. Is that how it has to happen all the time? No, that's the wrong picture that is being drawn, but that's, it's easy to be overly literal when we're looking at these metaphors, but they're pictures. And if we try and interpret them too carefully, they'll, they'll creak. What Paul is trying to say is this. Here's the point. You, of course, can talk straight to the Father, but you might feel, what if he doesn't want to hear me? What if I'm interrupting him? What if he's too busy? What if he's forgotten who I am? What if he's already annoyed with me because of what I'd done three years ago, let alone what I did yesterday? Oh, dear me, if only I had a good friend who could introduce me to the Father, who could walk with me into his presence. Paul says, yep, that's the Spirit. Elsewhere, he'll say, yep, that's Jesus. It's not that we need them to get through barriers. It's that they are in the process of introducing us to the Father. That's the role of the Spirit, to be a prosagogue on our behalf, introducing us to the Father. It's even better than that because this, this little verb here, have, is actually in the present tense. Now, in the present tense in Greek, um, there is no present simple tense in Greek. So you don't say, I sit. You say, I am sitting. It's a continuous activity. And so what you have is the Spirit who is continually introducing us to the Father. Now, of course, this makes nonsense. It's not meant to be taken completely literally, but the picture is that the Father is constantly being introduced to you and the Spirit is con constantly introducing you to the Father. 